A faint glow of candlelight flickered across the clean white tablecloth. Soft jazz played from the speakers as I fixed my tie and verified that everything was ready for our anniversary meal. I'm home, honey. Lily's lovely voice rang out as her key clicked into the lock. I rounded the corner. A big smile spreads across my face. Welcome back. Beautiful. Lila strolled inside, looking a little untidy with her blouse untucked and hair mussed. An unsettling feeling sank in my gut, but I pushed it away. Her eyes widened at the romantic table setup. Sam, you didn't need to go through all of this bother. Of course I did. It's our 10-year anniversary, a night to celebrate my amazing wife. I proudly pulled out her chair. She sat stiffly while I poured two glasses of her favorite Cabernet throughout the tense supper. Lila appeared distracted and far away. There was something strange about her demeanor. When I finally brought up the matter, she flinched. It is nothing, really. I'm just not feeling 100% tonight. I knew in my bones she was lying, and it felt like a dagger to the heart after a decade of marriage. I thought we had established an unshakable foundation of love and trust. Now the foundation was cracking. After Layla went to the restroom, I noticed her phone on the table. A nagging hunch compelled me to pick it up, feeling bad even as I checked her messages. That's when I noticed it. Buddy sent a mysterious message about meeting later at a motel. My veins filled with ice as the dreadful reality began to emerge. Digging deeper, I discovered a hidden email account containing damning evidence, emails, and images, all pointing to Layla having an affair with her co-worker Damien. Not only that, but it seems Damien had been pressuring her for information about my business operations. The horrible treachery of it all made me quake with fury. I adored Layla with all of my being. How could she have done this to me? To us? Damien Snake had a clear angle, using my wife's emotions to snake his way into my company despite my death. I am blinded by pain and rage. I began putting a strategy into action. I would confront Layla and Damien, forcing them to reveal their deception in front of everyone we knew. The entire world would know they were liars and cheaters. Then, once I revealed their twisted betrayal, I would burn their lives to the ground, starting with Damien's profession and working my way up to completely destroying my soon-to-be ex-wife. I would make them scream for mercy if they believed this was simply a cheap fling they could get away with. They were about to get something else. This was war, and I had no intention of taking any captives. After learning Layla's duplicity, my mind raced with wrath, devastation, and a burning desire for vengeance. I adored that woman with everything I had. How could she rip my heart to bits like this for a cheap fling? Damien the Worm is attempting to get into my business by using my wife's infidelity. They would both face serious consequences for their dishonesty. I began by devising a detailed plan to expose their lies in front of all of our friends and family. It would be a sight they would never forget. A masquerade ball to commemorate our anniversary. Layla and her lover are the ones who actually hide behind masks. Invitations were sent out under the guise of an expensive party celebrating ten happy years of marriage. Of course, now that I knew the reality, I wouldn't use the word blissful. Nonetheless, I played the role of the happily married husband to the fullest, portraying my great love for my lovely Layla in syrupy words. Everyone fell for the sweet lie, hook, line, and sinker. Even Layla herself, who appeared slightly unwell when I handed her the elaborate invitation with real gold-leaf calligraphy. Sam, this is too much, she muttered, avoiding my gaze. I brushed off her worries with a bright smile. Nonsense. This marks our anniversary, the ideal occasion to commemorate the affection we share. Guests arrived dressed in spectacular masks and dresses, none more so than Layla, who wore a glittering green gown that clung to every sumptuous curve. If I hadn't known the truth, I may have fell for her breathless performance as the blushing, gorgeous bride all over again. But I knew better now. My eyes shifted. Layla moved among the gathering like a hunter, weighing up her target and meeting friends with the ease of a con artist. Only when she saw Damien across the ballroom did her immaculate veneer crack for a fleeting time in another world. I may have missed the way her lips parted subconsciously, or how her fingers nervously toyed with her diamond necklace. They were fully and completely trapped in my trap. I had paid heavily to guarantee that Layla and her boyfriend were matched together, masks hiding their deceitful faces. 
but unable to conceal the sparks of illicit yearning that would burn across the dance floor over the next few hours. I enjoyed organizing a series of events that would fill them with dread when the waiter stumbled and nearly spilled beverages over Damien's fine outfit. The illumination seemed a little too warm on their twined forms. Small, subtle moments culminate in intense agony. The conclusion came when I stepped in front of the audience, two crystal flutes hoisted high, ready to offer a heartfelt toast to the love of my life. Damien and Layla stood beside me in their finest attire, completely unaware of the impending reckoning. Friends and family, I began, my voice echoing down the corridor. I'd want to thank everyone for joining us tonight to commemorate a particularly unique occasion. The tenth anniversary of my marriage to Layla, the most beautiful woman in my life. Damien shuffled uncomfortably and Layla regarded me with wide, worried eyes. Good. Allow the snakes to feel the noose tighten. They say love is blind, but in our situation I believe it was more about being blind to treachery. You see, I recently found that my lovely wife has not been so faithful after all. As I pulled an envelope from my jacket in her pocket, gasps echoed throughout the gathering, and it appears that her accomplice in deception was someone I considered a friend. Damien is my wife's co-worker. Samantha, please, Layla muttered, her voice filled with dread. I ignored her plea and pulled out a glossy photo that revealed the extent of her indiscretion. Her and Damien were involved in a frantic, hungry embrace, his hands caressing the curves I used to admire. More horrible images were scattered on the tile, leaving a foul trail as I emptied the envelope, each one more incriminating than the previous until the truth was revealed before everyone's stunned eyes. God... Layla let out a sob, tears staining the exquisite mask painted across her cheeks. Damien, for his part, had turned a mottled crimson purple as if a blood boil was about to burst. His mouth worked ineffectively for a few moments before he muttered this. This does not signify what you believe. Save it. I cut him off with a look of contempt. You slithered into my wife's bed. I used her to try to acquire information on my business. I have all the proof I need that you both are depraved snakes. I turned away from their crushed, humiliated shapes and addressed the stunned guests once more. So, everybody, raise your glasses and join me in a toast. To genuine love and the repercussions of betraying it. They complied and ice clinked against Crystal, completely speechless. In light of this dramatic marriage implosion, as I flung back the bitter contents of my own glass, I noticed Layla's devastated expression. Sam, she said, reaching out and pleading Lee, too little, too late. Her obligation, as well as that of her co-conspirator, will be paid up in full soon. For now, all I wanted to do was drink in their embarrassment and despair, because this was only the beginning of my retaliation campaign, and I was only getting started. Damien, the snake, had been humiliated in front of all of our friends and family. Their lies and betrayal are exposed in spectacular fashion. But that wasn't enough. Not nearly enough to heal the huge wound. They tore into my heart and life with their lies. Damien went straight for the professional jugular. I gathered every piece of evidence connected to his dubious business practices, including concealed emails, bank documents, and all of the information he gained through my wife's affair. Then I assembled an airtight case and anonymously mailed it to the authorities. Less than a week later, a SWAT squad stormed Damien's corner office, hauling him out in handcuffs as shocked co-workers watched. He strained against his bonds, yelling, making semi-coherent denials and protesting his innocence. I could only imagine his stunned expression as the harsh reality dawned on him while attempting to crawl into my company. He had only sealed his own fate, that $5 million business endeavor he had undoubtedly promised. My wife had just become a concrete toilet as Damien sat in custody, awaiting his inevitable sentence. I shifted my concentration to completely demolishing the life Layla had taken for granted at my side as my first priority, ensuring she would never see a single dime of my hard-earned fortune in the opulent home we'd established together. My lawyer served her with divorce papers in record speed, with carefully marked boxes indicating my desire to pursue sole custody of our children. Layla may have walked away from her marriage vows, but I had no intention of allowing her to renounce her motherly responsibilities. During the proceedings, I presented an excruciatingly thorough account of her crimes, including not just the affair but also her dubious financial ties to Damien's fraudulent activities. 
I depicted her as an inadequate mom who acted recklessly, endangering her own family. The judge's face remained obscured, but the incriminating evidence spoke for itself. The court judgment really surprised Layla. When the verdict was read for custody granted to me based on a credible history of adultery and poor ethical conduct, she burst into tears and shook her hands. She handed over any claim to our riches or the property she had been evicted from in disgrace. For a brief moment, I felt pity for her, observing her distress at having nothing left. That flare quickly turned into a razor's edge of joy at a ruination so complete and justified. During these court proceedings, Damien was convicted of a slew of fraud and corruption counts. All of his ambitious aspirations and capitalistic delusions of grandeur resulted in a 15-year prison term. I almost wished he'd come out the other side so I could destroy him all over again. As for Layla, the consequences left her completely impoverished in every sense of the word. She crawled back to me one more time in those horrible days, pleading for forgiveness between heartbreaking sobs, having lost her home, children, and all sense of rank or dignity. Samantha, please, I never intended to hurt you in this way. I still adore you, I swear. I gave her an impassive look. All of the rage that had kept me going during this magnificent masterpiece of vengeance had now burned down to cold, dead ashes. You sacrificed a lifetime of love and family for a fling with a con artist who saw you as nothing more than a pawn. Layla flinched as the truth was brought naked. You are not the woman I fell in love with. You are suddenly a stranger to me, and I want you to remain that way. And with that final condemnation, I turned away and walked out of her life forever. Damien and Layla got exactly what they deserved. She knew personally the agony of being used and dumped as human garbage when she no longer met his requirements, while he rotted behind bars with all his great aspirations reduced to dust and bitter recriminations. It took years to gradually recover from the charred emotional wreckage of what I had lost. I surrounded myself with the few friends who stood by me through the ordeal, losing myself while building the business. I almost let Damien defile for his own gain, my new life slogan is to prioritize my children, my business, and living a fulfilling life. The wounds from Lila's treachery began to heal. What are your opinions about this story? Please let me know in the comments below. Now for the following story. Please enjoy. What is the most awful betrayal you can recall? After all, everyone has experienced deception, and there is no way to avoid it. However, the problem is different. I accept that a stranger can deceive me, but I don't anticipate it from my closest friends, and this is the most dreadful part. It was around 2 a.m., with only a few weak lights in the hallways. Darkness engulfed the surrounds. In my 10 by 10 cage, I could see dim outlines and shadows. Despite knowing that I should be sleeping, I lay with my arms folded behind my head, lost in thought. My mind traveled back to memories I'd tried to forget. Footsteps neared leading me to count softly, seven, eight, nine, and ten, until I noticed him peeping in. His expression was harsh and emotionless, similar to everyone else's here. He carried out his responsibilities, making his nighttime rounds without any yearning for companionship. It didn't matter if he noticed me gazing back. He was outside, and I was inside. As he passed me, I stopped counting. There was no use. He would not return for another ninety-two minutes. Staring at the ceiling, I began to make plans for when I would leave this place. Five days and a wake-up call, and I'd be walking through those doors for the last time. I figured that I'd completed roughly seven months of my one-year sentence. My employment awaited me, but little else would remain unchanged after my release, and I was well aware of this. My older brother had repaired my car, cared for my home, and managed what was left of my finances after court fees. Was I still furious? Anger was an understatement for the emotions I felt. However, they remained dormant, waiting to be released until I was free of this captivity. I finally realized why men who serve 10 to 20 years in jail frequently become hollow shells upon release. When they enter, they leave every evidence of their humanity at the entrance. It is all about survival, and compared to the facility up north, where they send the most dangerous criminals. This facility resembles a luxury resort. So I closed my eyes again, expecting for the hundredth time to fall asleep and get a few hours of relaxation. I missed my previous bedroom, particularly the room's darkening curtains. But I knew that this place, like everything else in my life, 
would never be the same again. During our last chat in the prison's visitor area, my brother Gary mentioned that I would pick you up next Tuesday. Is there anything you particularly want to eat on your first night out? A steak. A good and juicy steak. Medium rare, I responded. Gary grinned at my request. You're too easy, Steve. I imagined you may ask for something more difficult for me to slip past my wife. You'll remain with Andy and me until you're back on your feet. I understand there isn't much food or furnishings left in your house. This will allow you to sort things out. It won't be the Ritz-Carlton, but it will be clean. You can come and leave as you like. He grinned, but I did not. I'd like to thank you. I started, but he interrupted me. Forget it. We are family, and it is what families do for one another. Don't worry about mom and dad. I'm confident they'll come around once everything settles down, but we both understood it would take a long time if ever, for emotions to settle on both sides. Have you seen my kids recently? The last time was two weekends ago at Mom and Dad's. Heather looks about the same, but John has this terrible bowl hairstyle that seems to be all the rage right now. It looks horrible. And I told him that. You know what that little brat told me? He said I wasn't his father, so he didn't have to listen to me. I wanted to slap some sense into him, but Mom was right there. You'll have your hands full with him. I knew John wouldn't have said such things in front of me. Despite being his father, he would not live with me upon my release. He and his sister planned to stay with their mother, at least temporarily. Nonetheless, I maintained patient. Time was ample after we got out of this awful place. I would wait for the ideal moment. I was not in a haste. Even though the divorce was official, I still owned half of the house. Kathy would have to pay me about $65,000 to buy out my part. I assumed she had emptied our bank lockbox, removing all of our bonds and CDs. Fortunately, I had presented my lawyer with a detailed list of everything, including serial numbers, to ensure clarity of ownership upon my release, which was approaching. Kathy and my erstwhile friend Bob had severely hurt me, thus giving me defeat. But that happened in the past. I had been caught off surprise and unprepared before, but it would not occur again in my lifetime. So I waited. I reminisced and looked forward to better days once I was away of this awful prison. Only then could I repair what remained of my personal life and begin a new chapter, closing the old one. I hoped to keep it all together till then. They were good, really good, because I didn't see it coming. In the weeks leading up to my arrest, a couple of my claimed friends approached me, implying that they were aware of what was going on but had not spoken up. What were their thoughts? Did they think I was aware of and accepted the situation? Each of those people must have understood that I would never condone such behavior. However, they may have chosen not to become engaged in someone else's difficulties because they were more concerned with their own. Our marriage appeared to be rock solid. At least I thought so. Twelve years and counting. We had two children, a beautiful home, and decent jobs. Of course, as in every marriage, we had our arguments— but I adored my wife and never imagined her capable of what she did. Our social circle was modest, with only a few couples from the neighborhood. Most had been married for more than seven years and were roughly our age. Almost all of us had at least two kids, except for Bob and his wife Connie, who faced infertility. Kathy certainly understood the underlying reason for their problems, but I preferred to keep a distance from everyone's personal lives, including theirs. We were near, but not very close. Eventually, our party saw that Connie was drinking excessively with no regard for driving home. At our meetings, alcohol flowed freely. We all lived near enough to crawl home if necessary. Connie's drinking began approximately a year ago and has gradually worsened. She initially felt more depressed, but after a few months, it progressed to something more troubling. Bob, preoccupied with caring for his wife, drank relatively little himself. Bob, love, could you kindly get me another drink? It began gently at the start of the evening. However, as the night went, she became increasingly demanding, eventually resorting to ordering him around with expletives. Due to her intoxication, he had to carry her home several times. I empathized with him, but I knew that was his problem, not mine. Connie was quite the spectacle tonight. I remarked while getting ready for bed. I believe Greg and Judy departed early because Connie kept attempting to undress and asking Greg for help. Nobody was letting her near the pool, that's for certain. I felt sorry for Bob. 
My wife joined in, tossing her clothing onto the chair next our bed. I understand Connie's frustration with their infertility, but taking it out on her husband is unjust. I suggested adoption, but she was not interested. She simply blamed her husband for the problem. They'll either settle it or separate, I observed. I doubt Bob will put up with it much longer. And what about next week's supper plans? I hope Connie behaves, but I am not holding my breath. Frankly, I wish we weren't leaving. I'll speak with her this week. Perhaps she'll tone things down for one evening. My wife responded hopefully. Let us hope so. I sighed, but Connie didn't quiet it down. Waiter, waiter. Connie shouted at anybody who passed past our table. How can one acquire a drink at this environment anyway? She slurred. Then she began berating Bob again. He was about to lose his temper when I interfered. Come on, Connie. You promised me a dance tonight, remember? I interfered, setting her cup on the table and dragging her to the dance floor. She started to object, but I was already guiding her away, determined to save the night in any way I could. We were dangerously near to being kicked out due of her, and I was doing everything I could to alleviate the situation. I circled the dance floor with her for three songs. As we danced our way toward the corridor, I noticed my wife speaking with Bob, who appeared to be miserable. Connie excused herself, stating that she needed to use the restroom. I escorted her to the ladies' room and assisted her inside. After waiting for five minutes with no sign of her, I considered my next move when I noticed two women headed into the restroom. I asked them to check on Connie. Their report was not encouraging. Is she wearing a bright yellow dress? One of them inquired via the doorway. When I confirmed, she shook her head. She passed out in one of the stalls. I can keep an eye on you when you enter. I entered, propped Connie up by the sink and sprayed cold water on her face. It briefly revived her, but her legs failed again. I wound up almost carrying her back to our table. Bob, let me assist you in getting Connie into your car. She is absolutely out of it, and I doubt she will wake up soon. I stood at the table helping Connie, who was obviously inebriated and bewildered. Bob could not hide his shame and irritation. Steve, I've got this covered. Please have a seat, and I will handle this. It is not the first time, but it is certainly the last. Despite his complaints, I escorted Connie out as he took her bag and said goodbye to everyone. I placed Connie down in the back seat and patted Bob on the back. Apologies, guy. What else could be said? I sincerely appreciate your aid tonight. I'm absolutely lost and don't know what to do next. You both should get counseling. It's unlikely that one of you can handle this alone. If you need assistance, please do not hesitate to contact Kathy or me. We will help however we can. Sure. I was just delivering words of comfort, but they sounded nice. Their issue was beyond our abilities to resolve, and to be honest, their troubles were likely too deep for anyone to tackle at this time. I gave them a few months at most. I wasn't far off, but no one predicted the end result. It was just after 10.30 p.m. on a Thursday. Three weeks later, we heard sirens and went outside to see what was going on. Bright lights flooded the end of our street. It seems that the entire neighborhood was flocking toward the disturbance. I shouted at Kathy, Stay here, I'll check it out. I ran toward the scene along with the rest of the neighborhood. It was a dismal sight. The fire rescue squad wrenched open Bob's car's driver's door while we watched. What's happening? Is Bob okay? It is not Bob. It's Connie. Someone claimed they were arguing. She snatched Bob's keys, dashed out, and drove away. He tried to stop her, but she ran down the street. She did not get far, as my informant described the frightening turn of events. Connie smashed into a parked automobile at about 40 miles per hour. I was going to ask about her condition when the ambulance arrived. They rapidly placed her onto a stretcher in the back and were gone in under 30 seconds. I noticed Bob jump into the back with her at the last second. The spectacle was finished, and their front door stood wide open, with lights still on inside the house. Bob and Connie appeared to have had a significant quarrel. Belongings were scattered on the floor. I called Kathy from Bob's phone to explain the situation and then secured the house, placing a note on the front door indicating that I had his house keys. How is Connie? My wife questioned when I returned home. Not good. She got in a car accident, did not wear her seatbelt, and swerved off before hitting with another vehicle. Although the airbag prevented her from hitting the steering wheel, she impacted the driver's side glass hard enough to shatter it. The cops believe she was speeding at roughly 35 miles per hour. Bob went to the hospital with her. So, we'll have to wait for updates. 
Do you think we should go there? Bob is going to need all of your support tonight, honey. Let's go there tomorrow when things have calmed down. For now, we should rest. Tomorrow will arrive sooner than we expect. We traded. We exchanged goodnight kisses, but Connie's illness kept us awake, resulting in little sleep. My phone rang about 11 the next morning. Stephen, Connie is on life support, my wife exclaimed urgently. I am leaving work immediately. Bob's falling apart and he needs help. Please join me as soon as you can, she urged before hanging up the phone. Bob seemed to be unable to catch a break. En route to the hospital, I picked up lunch for the three of us at a nearby McDonald's and arranged for Kathy's parents to pick up the kids from our house after school. I made my way softly down the corridor to the waiting area, where my wife and three others were offering comfort. Bob, how is she? I inquired. Not good, my wife mumbled. Bob was taken aside by the doctor quite some time ago. He emerged, stunned, and has spoken only a few words since. Bob. I ventured and took a seat beside him. Are you okay? It seemed like a banal inquiry, but I had to start somewhere. Steve, she is not going to make it. The doctor stated that cerebral activity is limited, if any. I do not know what to do. Bob broke down and buried his face in his hands. I gestured to everyone to allow us some space. Has anyone told Connie's parents? They're on their way and should arrive soon. Steve, the hospital staff, is inquiring about Connie's living will and whether she is an organ donor. It's beginning to feel like they're preying on my wife. The doctor even had the arrogance to bring up the issue of extracting the plug. If she is brain dead, it's my wife. They're not referring to a specific object. Bob's voice rose. Who cares who might be over here? Why can't they simply save her? They are doctors, damn it. Why cannot they save her? I had no response for him. Shortly later, Connie's parents arrived and entered her room alongside Bob. There was a lot of sobbing and cursing. It appeared that her father was blaming Bob for his daughter's predicament. After around 20 minutes, the attending physician entered and everyone exited the room. Connie's parents left devastated by the idea that they would never talk to their daughter again. We left the hospital at eight, stopping at Kathy's parents' house to pick up the kids. I wish I never have to make that decision. I kept reminding myself that two days later, with Bob, Connie's parents, and the doctor there, they turned off the life support equipment. Connie went away quietly. We tried to console Bob in any manner we could, despite Connie's turbulent behavior during the previous 18 months. Bob had a profound affinity for her. In times like these, people tend to remember the good rather than the bad. The funeral gathered a great crowd and even the males shed tears. Bob took her death especially deeply, taking a month off work to see his family in the East. I told him that we would look after his affairs while he was abroad. As I got ready for bed, fatigued from the previous several weeks, I told my wife, you know I love you, right? If I ever wind up like Connie, please let me go. I could not bear being kept alive by machines. Don't speak like that, Steve. Connie, it was an accident. This will not happen to us. Bob arrived, relatively functional, a few weeks later, and solicited Kathy's assistance in clearing away Connie's possessions. I assisted him in updating his bedroom furniture. After three months, he appeared to be doing better. We kept him involved in social events even putting him up on blind dates, though it was too soon. About six months later, Bob found his spark, and life appeared to be returning to normal again. I was excited for him. It was a relief to see him smile and participate in social occasions again. It was a relief to have Bob back. Looking back, I probably should have seen. Or maybe I did, but it didn't really register. Kathy and I appeared to be a happy marriage, but there was an underlying disquiet that I couldn't identify. Our intimacy remained consistent, just like it had been before the crisis with Connie and Bob. But something seemed odd. Perhaps it was my imagination. Nonetheless, after a few months, I found the confidence to ask Kathy if anything was bothering her. Not much, Steve. Why are you asking? She responded. I do not know. You've appeared distant recently. I said this in an attempt to avoid confrontation. Everything is fine. She reassured me with a smile. Perhaps you've been seeking greater intimacy. If this is the case, all you need to do is ask. Intimacy, I pondered. She had always described it as lovemaking. And why do I have to ask? Feeling foolish? I merely smiled, 
kissed her, and muffled my thoughts. Friday, August 20th, will always be engraved in my memory. It was the day that my world fell around me. Kathy called my office, notifying me that our children would be spending the weekend with her parents and asking about my expected arrival time at home. Alan, you are my sweetheart. Sure, I'm home a little sooner. In that case, is there anything specific you'd like me to pick up on the way? I asked. There is no need for that. I just need to know when you will be home. Her remark came as I hung up. A plethora of ideas entered my mind. I glanced at my watch and saw that it was 3.30. Damn. I still had an hour and a half until I could depart. I eased off the pedal, hoping to escape a speeding ticket on my way home. Despite this, I managed to set a new personal record by getting home in just under 28 minutes. It didn't seem strange to me when I noticed two cars in the driveway, one of which belonged to our friend Bob, who was showing off his new car. Hello, dear. I've arrived. I called as I entered from the garage. Bob and Catherine were in the kitchen. Hello, Bob. I greeted him. What is up, Steve? I need to talk with you. Please take your seat. Kathy spoke nervously, her voice shaking as she wrung her hands. Something felt odd. I'll just remain standing. I told my wife, looking at them both. Steve, I wanted to let you know before you received the documents, Kathy began. I was bewildered. What papers were offered? Kathy, she stepped back. Divorce paperwork. She hardly managed to speak. My heart skips a beat. Kathy, what are you talking about? Divorce paperwork. I do not comprehend, Steve. Bob started before I interrupted him. Bob, keep out of this. This is between my wife and I. Then it struck me. I looked at her, then at him and finally back at her. Bob, I believe you should leave right now. My hands curled into fists. Bob, remain, my wife insisted. This also involves Steve. Bob, you have ten seconds to leave this blasted house. If you don't, you can end up leaving in a corpse bag. He moved towards the door. Kathy, we need to discuss now, I yelled at her. Steve, there is nothing to discuss. I am in love with Bob. Steve, I apologize. You deceptive woman. How long have you been having an affair with Bob, our alleged friend? Was it even before he pushed Connie over the edge, killing her? Bob paused his escape and met my stare with passion in his eyes. Steve, you know nothing. I believe I understand. While I was trying to soothe you, you betrayed me with my wife. I need to do something to you. You will face the consequences. Do you hear me? They were standing next to each other, plainly scared, and I was screaming and raging. If you believe that I will simply put up with such treatment, think again. Both of you, leave my house. I screamed at them. Steve, this is my house as well, Katie responded, regaining her calm. Not anymore. Unfaithful persons are not tolerated. And you certainly suit the description, don't you? I could barely stop myself from injuring them. I will depart as soon as I have packed my belongings. There is no way you will leave right now if you know what is best for you. Katie, let us just leave, Bob offered, pointing to the door. Listen to your new coward. I baited Bob, waiting for a reaction. Steve, I'll come back for my belongings as soon as you calm down. You will be six feet deep by then, I warned angrily. They both exited via the kitchen door. Their stare remained riveted on me the entire time. After that, I lost control. I drank at least two beers and did significant damage to dishes, our microwave, and four walls, all in the period of two hours. It took four visits, but I finally emptied Kathy's bedroom closet emptying its contents on the front yard and setting the sprinkler timer for four hours. I shut and locked the doors, locking them with safety chains. There was a lot of yelling and screaming for the following 45 minutes, but it stopped once I completed my sixth beer. As a light drinker, six beers left me comatose until the next morning, which was probably for the best when I went out to get the morning newspaper. I observed that Kathy had retrieved all of her possessions— at least I won't have to drag them to the curb. I reflected, tried to find solace in my deeds, though unsuccessfully. I was upset, and thinking about it only made me angry. I probably should have told my brother and parents about the incident, but I didn't. I wasn't sure who Kathy had notified, but I assumed most people were still uninformed. However, following last night's events, I stopped caring. When I called Kathy's parents' residence to speak with my children, her mother refused. Steve. Kathy picked them up last night. That is not true, Fran. Last night, Kathy was too preoccupied with retrieving her clothes off our front lawn. Let me speak with my children, I shouted into the phone. 
She hung up and did not return my future calls. Jerk, I mumbled beneath my breath. I wasn't thinking straight, but I knew enough to cut my losses by canceling all of our credit cards. I notified the corporations that their funds had been taken and requested an instant cancellation at an ATM. I took all of the cash available from our savings and bank accounts. I planned to go to the bank first thing Monday morning. After a brief breakfast, I planned out my day, changed the code on the garage door opener, installed new locks on all doors, and moved anything important to my brother's house. As I was about to go, the doorbell rang, causing a pause. I looked through the crowd and noticed someone clutching a huge manila envelope. I refrained from opening the door, knowing that he would ultimately catch up to me. Just not today. I briefed my brother Gary and his wife Sandy regarding the previous night's events, urging them to keep the bag of belongings inconspicuous. They conveyed their sympathy, acknowledging that Kathy's actions were regrettable. Afterward, I went to Home Depot and returned home with three new lock sets, expecting a two-hour installation process. However, as I approached my block, I noticed Bob's car in the driveway. He stood beside his car, watching Kathy load goods into it. Maybe I should have driven by and waited until they finished, but I was too angry for that. Instead of passing, I accelerated with tires shrieking. I turned into my driveway and crashed with the back of Bob's car. Bob had hardly gotten into his car before mine collided with his, pushing it against the closed garage door. I reversed, backed up about 15 feet before accelerating again. This time, I drove his car through the garage door, steam rising from under my hood and engine, making a terrible noise I couldn't see. However, when I tried to reverse again, my car cooperated. Despite flooring it, I only backed up about 10 feet. My car could only move Bob's vehicle a few steps before stalling. My pulse pounded as I sprang out of my car, propelled by adrenaline. I took my son's aluminum bat from the garage and began hitting madly. Bob cowered in his car as I shattered both driver's side glass and finished off the windshield. As I prepared to open his door, I heard loud voices behind me. Drop the bat and place your hands on your head, an authoritative voice demanded. I complied, turning to see two police officers outside the garage, their pistols drawn. Drop the bat, place your hands on your head, and kneel down. Now I see that resistance was pointless. I surrendered the bat and followed their commands. I was thrown to the garage floor, handcuffed, and placed in the back of the cop cruiser. Only then did Bob get out of his automobile. He appeared genuinely disturbed and terrified. I wanted to lean out the window and tell him that I wouldn't miss the next time. But I never had the chance. My wife, whom I detested, was crying, speaking with the cops, and glaring at me. I smiled back at her. I was transported downtown, processed, and permitted a single phone call. I called my brother Gary because it was the weekend and I needed to spend two nights in jail before my court appearance on Monday morning. My appearance before the judge was brief, approximately three minutes. I pleaded not guilty, and judge set the bail. It wasn't until late afternoon that Gary could post bail and get me out of jail. Steve there talking about attempted murder, or at the absolute least, assault with a deadly weapon. I am aware. I heard it at my initial hearing before pleading not guilty. First things first. I need you to take me to the bank right away. She has most likely emptied the accounts, but I will double check to make sure. Our savings and checking accounts were depleted of cash, but the CDs and bonds in our lockbox remained intact. However, a court injunction prevented me from accessing any of them. I voiced my disappointment as she picked up her phone. You could have kept at least dollar five in our bank account. You definitely disappoint me, she responded. I needed the money for ourselves and the kids until the hold was lifted. What is the problem? Isn't Bob earning enough for all of you? I have a house payment to make. Perhaps I should start a fire in the living room to take the edge off. Steve, stop the drama. I apologize, but you are making things more difficult than it needs to be. Can't you simply accept it and go on? I'll move on once my children return home. Steve, I can't do it, especially given your current state of mind. I don't think you'd ever injure them, but I can't take the risk. After everything is sorted, you can see them as much as you like. You don't have to worry about the kids. But the same cannot be said for you or your sweetheart, Bob. I'm going to finish this chat now. From now on, you must speak with my counsel. Steve, I'm sorry for how things turned out. Kathy, you and Bob will come to regret this. She hung up.
When my court date arrived several weeks later, my counsel claimed temporary insanity. He claimed that after Kathy confessed about herself and Bob, I lost control. Kathy and Bob stated that I had threatened them before. Despite the restraining order, they feared for their lives. Mr. Moore, the judge, spoke to me after reviewing Kathy and Bob's statements. Did you tell Mr. Kelly that if he didn't leave your house, he'd depart in a corpse bag? I can't recollect the exact phrases, Your Honor. It could have been something similar, but how would you respond if a buddy had an affair with your wife? My defense fell flat, my attorney sharply admonished me. Steve, stay silent. Do you understand? You can no longer remember what you said or did. I get it. I am attempting to argue that you were oblivious of your activities. Your statement to the judge doesn't help your case. He was right. Chris, my boss and major character witness were entirely supportive of me. He testified that I was an excellent employee. He had never heard me use profanity or lose my cool. After Chris's testimony, the case was closed and I waited for the judge's ruling. He promised to give his verdict in the next days. The next day at work, my boss suggested knowing people who could solve our problems if I wanted. Thank you for the offer, but I'll do it my way, I responded. On the drive home, I wondered what their fee would have been. Six excruciating months and $12,000 later, I found myself taken advantage of by both my ex-wife and the court system. The divorce was finalized and she received 50% of everything, including the house and other assets that were to be sold. She said that her jewelry was missing and accused me of taking it. I protested that mine was also gone, claiming she took it all on the day of the incident. At least I didn't have to make up for that accusation. The legal system dealt the final blow. I can't believe they've sentenced me to a year in jail. Are they out of their mind? I yelled at my lawyer as the judge read the verdict. Steve, it could have been worse. You may have been charged with manslaughter. If things had gone differently, display nice behavior. You'll be out in under eight months. And if you maintain your record clean, it will not be permanently stained. It will be expunged in two years. Instead, then letting a crime stalk you indefinitely. Serve your time, get out, and get on with your life. It was easy for him to claim that he wasn't the one facing 24 hours a day in prison. I attempted to appeal, but it had no results after three months. In little than a year, my once great life had deteriorated. My head, Kathy, and Bob are to blame for that. Steve, when you go, your job will still exist. Simply don't do anything stupid in there and keep your guard up. Chris provided brief but sound advice after I bid my children farewell on Sunday and presented myself to the court, where I was placed in the county jail to begin my sentence. Despite thorough online reading, I immediately found that the reality of incarceration was far different from what I had expected. Although I had arranged for my brother to deposit funds into my inmate account, I discovered that the available items mostly consisted of junk food and other unnecessary items. Without access to a cell phone or computer, I resorted to pen and paper to document my thoughts, and I made collect calls to my brother, mother, and children every other week to stay connected with the outside world. During one of my brother's visits, he told me, Steve, I'll make sure your car is repaired before you get released. I know a mechanic who can do it for the amount covered by insurance during his downtime, and I'll make sure it's completed before you leave. In addition, I've scheduled someone to mow your grass, and I saw you hadn't fitted the new deadbolt, so I fixed that. I informed Kathy that if she wanted entry to the house, she needed to give me 24 hours' notice. The last time she came here, she took everything she and the kids owned. She also tried to take their beds, but I requested she provide a court warrant for the removal of any furniture, which she did not pursue further. I felt relieved that my brother was looking after my affairs, Kathy agreed that my parents may spend time with my children every other Sunday afternoon. However, her attitude became progressively antagonistic each time she claimed to be tolerating it out of courtesy, saying that my parents were no longer members of her family. According to what my mother learned from the kids, Kathy was speaking poorly about not only me, but also of my entire family. She started referring to me as their jailbird father and warned them that whenever I was released, she would confront me about what I could and couldn't do for them. Despite her behavior, my parents followed all of her instructions. I wish they would refuse her, but they insisted on keeping open lines of communication with her. Seven days before being released, I phoned my lawyer to confirm my visitation privileges. 
I would have the children every other weekend, and a full month during the summer holidays would be divided equally and alternated annually. I told my boss of my imminent release, stating that I would need a week to acclimate and organize my life. I've never been happy to ditch my orange jumpsuit for streetwear. Gary waited outside for me. We stopped at the nearest bar. Here's to freedom, I said, clinking our bottles together and finishing the first of three beers. Andy has made a feast for us at home. A steak meal with all the trimmings, just as you wanted. I thought you could remain with us for the first few nights while you sort through your belongings at the house. It is still on the market, but there have been no offers. Kathy wants to cut the price, but she needs your consent. I grinned. You still have all of the furniture in the home. However, I followed your suggestions and got rid of the main bedroom set. Dinner was wonderful. I ate more than I had in the previous eight months, loosening my belt and enjoying a bottle of wine. I liked the genuine feeling of freedom to do whatever I chose. When I wanted, I ate and drank excessively. I dimly remember drinking five or six beers and at least three glasses of wine. I didn't wake up until after ten o'clock the next morning, and it was well past eleven before I could sit up and walk to the bathroom without stumbling. I staggered downstairs to the kitchen and saw a note on the counter telling the story. If you're reading this, you got through yesterday night. Coffee has been brewed, and everything else you might need is in the refrigerator. You can find soap in the spare bathroom, a razor with shaving lotion, a toothbrush, and toothpaste. If you need anything else, we'll figure it out when I get back from work tonight. Your car and house keys are on a rack near the back door. I hope I don't have to remind you to be sensible. See you around 530. It turns out my brother knew me better than I thought. I only managed to consume two cups of coffee and an English muffin. After a wash and shave, I began to feel more human. Gary had laid out fresh clothing for me, and I was on my way home within an hour. The exterior of the house had not changed. I waited in my just-repaired automobile for what felt like an eternity before getting out. Memories, both joyful and unpleasant, raced through my thoughts. I observed the new deadbolt lock and turned the key to enter. It was anarchy inside, with stuff strewn about. Someone seems to have rummaged through the property in haste. Clothing was thrown on the floor, the kitchen was reasonably tidy, and the fridge still had the same food from months before. Leaning against the sink, I examined the damage on the wall where my fist had struck with a stud, which had not yielded as expected. I winced, remembering the intensity of that moment when I came across the two of them that night. Damn, I muttered quietly as I ascended the stairs. The children's closets were bare, save for a few forgotten trinkets. My own bedroom was eerily empty, save for my dresser and clothes hanging in the closet. The carpet showed faint marks from where our bed and her dresser once stood. This room clearly needed a complete overhaul before I could enter it again. The rest of the house remained undisturbed, requiring a thorough cleaning if I ever planned to sell it. But selling was not on my agenda. I had different plans. I sat down at the kitchen table and started writing down activities that needed to be completed. While I could have done the majority of the repairs myself, I was past that point in my life. I just wanted it finished. I made my way to the bank, carrying the list in my pocket. My mind is bent on the future. I wasn't expecting to find the lockbox emptied. I required official proof from the bank about her conduct. They stated that they have video documentation of the lockbox area if needed. A conversation with my attorney. Her acts. However, I was unaware that he had already begun legal proceedings to collect everything. We appeared to have won the initial battle, as the court had already ordered Kathy to return all of the items she had taken from the lockbox. My lawyer briefed me on the circumstances. Steve She is offering to exchange her share of the house for your share of the CDs and bonds. I instructed her to comply with the court's order and return everything. Alternatively, ignoring a direct court order may result in arrest. I'm not bothered whether she has any negative feelings towards me. My obligation is to only represent your interests and ensure that they are legally protected. That is precisely why you retain the services of a lawyer. I told myself that when I returned home, I would appraise my remaining goods. Knowing about a neighboring contractor, I made a mental note to call him for wall repairs. I next scheduled for Mary Maids to do a thorough cleaning, focusing on the kitchen and dining area where I had unwittingly caused some chaos. Unfortunately, the incident did not involve Kathy's grandmother's beloved china. 
Fortunately, critical services such as electricity, phone, and water remained operational, allowing me to anticipate eight reoccupations by the weekend, pending the procurement of a bed. I'm looking for a queen-sized bed rather than a complete bedroom suite. After a long hiatus, I decided to go mattress shopping. The variety of styles, materials, and prices was staggering, ranging from $500 to $7,000, prioritizing comfort over opulence. I chose a strong box spring mattress and frame for just over $900. This prevented me from being reminded of any previous misdeeds while sleeping on a second-hand mattress. Hank, the contractor, arrived on Saturday morning to discuss repairs to the property damage. Your barriers appear strong. It must have been painful to strike that dam. He commented with a faint grin. I only want the holes filled and a fresh coat of white paint. Nothing fancy, I informed him. He jotted down some notes while he examined the damage to all four walls. How does 200 sound to you? Pretty low. So that's my offer. Take or leave it. Hank, I still have money left. I do not want to take advantage of our friendship. Steve, whether you know it or not, you did. Do me and the boys in the area a huge favor. After what happened with Bob in the automobile, most of us began to look up to you. I'm not sure what I would have done if it had been my wife and I. But every wife in the neighborhood knows their husband would never allow what yours did to you. Randy and Linda had a huge fight one night when Linda stole Kathy's. Randy said if she felt that way, she could go since he might have done something severe, if she had done this to him. Hank paused, took a long breath, and resumed. Let me emphasize, you are our neighborhood hero. It made me smile a little, but he had no idea. I thanked him and told him to start any time he wanted. With that, I had done all of the easy chores on my to-do list in six weeks. All bonds and CDs had been returned to the bank's lockbox. The home had been fixed and carefully cleaned. Life was beginning to settle into my new normal. When my kids spent their first full weekend with me, we were all nervous. To put it another way, none of us really knew what to say. Children, I understand. It may feel strange for a while, but remember that this is still your home. If you have an opinion, don't be afraid to express it. I want you to feel free to express yourself without worrying about hurting my feelings. Within the past year, I've developed thicker skin, and there's nothing you could say that would surprise me anymore. I believe they felt relieved that I opened the topic. Dad, we both care about you and are sorry. Did Mom do this? John said, and Heather agreed. Dad, we didn't discover out about Bob until after that weekend when Mom informed us that we would be living at his place. We were dissatisfied and we remained so. There was nothing you could have done. It was your mother's decision. Even if Bob wasn't involved, your mother and I would never reconcile. What we had is in the past, and we must all accept it. I just want you to know that I am still your father. I love you both. And I'll always be available if you need anything. We shared a hug. We wrapped up the evening with pizza and a movie. Did I wish to denounce and condemn their mother's infidelity? Absolutely. But I was not going to descend to her level, at least not yet. Our first weekend together was a triumph, in my opinion. We began gingerly, but eventually felt like the family we had always been. However, in this new familial dynamic, we were simultaneously together and separate. One thing I did was give John a good haircut. There will be no more bowl cuts for him. On the surface, life proceeded normally. I kept my job, had a small social circle of local acquaintances, and spent the majority of my time caring for the kids. Things became considerably busier when John started playing soccer and Heather started dancing. Everyone but my brother advised me to move on and start again. You are still young. You can find another mate. Begin a new chapter. To them, I would just say, to hell with you and your advice. I had put 14 years in that relationship, and it was entirely up to me whether I remained angry or not. Their statements were empty. They hadn't been through what I experienced in the last two years. To relieve discomfort, you may need to extract a pound of flesh, and that is exactly what I meant to do. Kathy advocated lowering the house price. I strongly refused. She was infuriated. I could care less. Steve, the house will not sell at this price in this market downturn. To entice purchasers, we need to reduce the price by at least $20,000. If you are willing to give up $20,000 from your share, I might consider it. Otherwise, the price stays fixed. 
Despite my reservations, we ultimately split the bonds and CDs. She spent hers in three months on a new automobile and a vacation for herself. And Bob? Not me, however. I saved every cent. It was the start of my own small nest egg, eight and a half months after my release from jail. A fire broke out in Bob's home. It was suspected that while they were at a soccer game, someone poured gasoline into the electrical box in the back of the house, lighting it on fire. By the time the fires were extinguished, the back portion of the house had been damaged, leaving them without power. The next day, two police policemen arrived at my home. A visit to the police station was unsuccessful. You see, I had been at a neighborhood event with ten witnesses to back up my alibi. One of the officers charged me. Steve, you were only one block away. You might have simply sneaked away and completed this. My only response was, prove it. I let them continue for a while, but when I had had enough, I took action. If you don't mind, I'll leave, I said, rising to my feet. Mr. Moore, we haven't finished with you yet. The larger of the two cops claimed they appeared to be following the good policeman, evil cop pattern. I told them, either charge me, release me, or I'll call my lawyer because I won't say anything else. I brought out my cell phone and looked at them. We will release you, but keep an eye on you, the officer stated. I smiled internally, mentally checking off one item on my to-do list, leaving two more to do. I offered to take my children because they could not stay in a powerless house. Bob's home. Repairs were expected to take at least two months, so the three of us took a brief holiday together. Steve, I know you did it, regardless of what the cops say. Kathy noted suspiciously one evening when she arrived to pick up the children for dinner. I don't know what you're talking about. I was with some wonderful pals, or should I say my good friends. It's a shame that you and Bob are no longer welcome at the gatherings. Perhaps I can put in a good word for you, I suggested cynically while smiling inside. Do not bother. We wouldn't go even if they begged us, she said coldly. So I suppose you have each other. And that is all that matters right now. Kathy answered with widening eyes, asking, What does that mean? Nothing. I just meant that you and Bob are really fortunate to have each other. I responded with a smile. The children, feeling genuine this time, wanted to spend more time with me, much to Kathy and Bob's dismay. I overheard Bob and the kids having furious arguments in which they insisted he wasn't their father. Kathy attempted to mediate, but eventually advised me not to further the tensions between Bob and the children. Kathy, I am not sure what you are referring to. I never talk ill of you in front of the children. They know you're their mother, and I've told them several times to respect and obey you and Bob. Him? He's a deceptive, despicable guy who should have been dealt with from birth. Aside from that, I believe he is decent enough. If looks could kill, I would already be dead. He is kind to your children, and I do not want you to continue bad-mouthing him to them. That is not going to happen. He means nothing to me. I can only hope to urinate on his grave someday. She shot me another glare. Of course, I would never intentionally harm him. Steve, I swear, she began. What are you going to do? Kathy, cheat on me, divorce me, toss me in jail and make my life miserable. Wait, you have already done all of those things, right? I suppose there is nothing else you can do to me, is there? Why don't you go back to that horrible excuse for a spouse and leave me alone, without another word? She turned and went back to her house. And to think I once loved that woman, I mumbled to myself as I observed her retreat work going well. It only took me a few weeks to catch up after I returned. Chris urged me to take on four more accounts. It would take more time, but with no children or anyone else at home. What more did I need to do in the evenings? Once I made first contact with the clients, I scheduled several two-day trips to each facility to familiarize myself with its operations. While three of the accounts were simple and provided no workload, the fourth TW Inc. posed a considerable obstacle. They were in the process of transforming their production process, which required monthly visits just to keep up with the changes. The person initially assigned to help me with these modifications left a lot to be desired. Despite his education, he was disorganized, frequently neglecting to give vital information. When I pressed him for information, his demeanor became quite haughty. Chris, I do not wish to cause trouble, but without the necessary resources, I will be unable to perform the necessary improvements, which may disrupt their system. I explained after two fruitless tries to remedy the problem. Eventually, I was designated as a middleman between the engineer and myself. 
From that point forward, I worked with a woman named Monica who provided direct support to the engineer, Steve. Monica Bradley. She introduced herself. She extended her hand for a handshake while holding a degree in process engineering. She'd only been with the company for five years. Nonetheless, our partnership was really effective. Monica found a way to provide me all of the resources I needed. As we neared the end of phase one, I invited her to dinner as a mark of gratitude for her assistance. Monica, I'd want to treat you and your husband to dinner tonight to convey my appreciation for all of your assistance. I proposed that the Hilton, where I'm staying, have an amazing restaurant. So why don't you plan on meeting me there around six o'clock? After exchanging handshakes, I departed the plant about 430 for the following hour. I caught up on papers and emails, marveling at how people functioned before the internet. At 5 p.m., I went downstairs to the restaurant to wait for Monica and her husband. Monica entered the restaurant by herself at precisely 6 p.m. I motioned her to the table and stood up to greet her. Is your husband parking his car? I inquired. Steve, I am not married. I sorry. I just assumed. I admitted, looking at the rings on her finger as I pulled out her chair. I wear these rings to maintain professional boundaries at work. This prevents anyone from attempting to flirt, fearing a lawsuit for workplace harassment. Furthermore, she explained that marriage seemed to speed up career progress. This is largely due to the perception that married employees are more stable. How do you handle business gatherings like this? I simply notify everyone that he is either away or busy with something else. I've done it so often that they no longer question me. You sure had me misled, I commented. We had a wonderful meal, during which I highlighted the highlights of the previous two years. I cannot believe how they handled you. It's dreadful. Tell me about it. But that's in the past, and I'm moving on. Or at least trying to, I replied. But thoughts of vengeance persisted. Steve, you are still young, and there are many women out there who would appreciate you, she reassured, flushing slightly. You're probably correct, but I haven't had the time or enthusiasm to go back into the dating scene. I'm still cautious. Well, you did ask me out, right? I joked about you and your hubby. If I wasn't married, would you have asked me out? She inquired. I probably would have. You are simple to talk to and lovely to be around. Not to mention, you are nothing like my ex, I confessed. I'll take it as a compliment. She laughed, and the rest of the evening went nicely. The following day, I left and would not return for nearly a month. I told her to call me weekly, especially if any problems happened. I began to feel more at ease around women, including those beyond my small circle. During my visits, we would regularly go out at night, which happened every few weeks. Although I still had trust concerns, I was actively addressing them via phone conversations and emails. We maintained communication. After a few months, our connection proceeded to kissing and other intimate acts, indicating my willingness to pursue things further. Was I regaining my feeling of normalcy? Monica discussed the conflict on Wednesday night, and it did not create any issues. We had been amorous the night before, and I had forgotten to pick up condoms. Steve Letts had planned for Thursday evening, she told me, kissing me passionately before leaving. I was already indulging myself as she walked to the elevator. On Thursday, I made a mental note to bring protection. On Wednesday, I used a city map to find a restaurant I had not yet tried, having exhausted all local options. After six trips, I went on what I called a research mission, locating a delightful Indian eatery approximately 25 minutes away. I took a corner booth, ordered a beer, and the entire sampler platter ready to decompress. I didn't notice their coming, but I heard a familiar laugh shortly after my lunch arrived. I regretted switching sides in my booth and immediately wished I hadn't. To my dismay, Monica sat with another man at an adjacent table, and their chemistry indicated that it was not their first date. They spoke, joked, held hands, and kept eye contact. After witnessing their affection, I lost my appetite in five minutes. I quickly paid the amount and fled. She didn't seem conflicted at all. I told myself on Thursday that I would avoid her as much as possible. Instead of eating at home, I went to McDonald's by myself for lunch. By three o'clock, Monica seems to be following me everywhere. She smiled, flirted, and caressed my lower arm. Did you overcome the conflict from last night? I inquired. Yes. And, 
she said, and tonight you're all mine. I was thinking of a quiet, cozy place you could appreciate. I discovered it last night, and the sampler platter is excellent, I said, looking into her eyes. What cuisine does it serve? she asked. What about Indian food? I responded, noticing her rapid shift in mood. It's funny. I was there yesterday night and ran into someone I recognized from across town. What are the odds? Monica? I did not flinch. Steve, let me explain, she said. There's no necessity. I should have known what kind of person you were after the first night at the restaurant. I've already dealt with one fraudulent individual. I don't need another. I walked away, ending my month-long tour. After ignoring four emails, I never received another. Trust concerns that I thought I had conquered reappeared with a fury due to Monica. Fortunately, I was allocated a male co-worker for my next trip. Three months later, I got an unexpected Christmas surprise. Bob's office parking lot was located opposite the building, at a four-way stoplight and a pedestrian crossing. On a Friday evening, just after 510. Bob, eager to go home, dashed across the street as soon as the pedestrian light illuminated. Unbeknownst to him, a car approaching from his left ran the red light. The crash happened quickly, taking everyone nearby off guard and giving them no chance to warn Bob. A black vehicle slammed with him, sending him over the hood and onto the pavement. Unfortunately, the witnesses, two women, were unable to detect much about the vehicle, including its license plate. They were only able to identify it as a black four-door sedan with tinted windows, which resembled my own black BMW. The following Saturday evening, while I was talking with my neighbor, a police cruiser rolled up to my driveway and exited. Two officers approached us. Mr. Moore. Could we speak to you? The short officer inquired. Certainly. Not a problem, Tom. I will catch up with you later, about the party. I reassured my neighbor, who was watching us carefully as he returned to his home. Mr. Moore, you have a black 2002 BMW 3i, the other officer responded, consulting his notepad. That is correct, I confirm. I am becoming very curious about the scenario. Is there an issue? Did I forget to pay my parking ticket or something? I was joking. However, the cops remained solemn. Is the car present here? They inquired further. Yes, it's inside the garage. What is this all about? I asked for an explanation. Excuse me, sir. We would require urgent access to the vehicle, please. My 22 car, while not new, had been repaired since the night I crashed with Bob's vehicle. It had its fair share of dings and scratches, but it was fully paid for and in good operating order. As one of the officers retrieved a camera from their car, I stepped inside to open the garage door. They moved to the front right side of the automobile and started taking pictures. Could you explain how these scratches and marks appeared on the bumper? I'm afraid I can't share specifics from the eight years since I purchased the automobile new. It's got a few Nixon scrapes. Now that I have answered your inquiries, could you just answer one of mine? What exactly is happening here? And how does this affect my car, Mr. Moore? There was a hit-and-run event yesterday afternoon, and eyewitnesses described a black sedan with tinted windows that matched your car's description, as well as countless others in town. I responded, becoming a little angry. Why am I singled out? Was my license plate detected or was I identified as the driver? The eyewitness saw only the automobile. As you can see, the front end has not sustained any substantial damage, and I can confirm my whereabouts from 8 in the morning to 6 in the evening yesterday. So why target me? Our visit was triggered by your history with the individual and reports of threats. We're leaving immediately. I appreciate your cooperation. Wait a moment. I called after them as they returned to their car. Who am I accused of hitting? Mr. Robert Kelly? I couldn't help smiling. Is he okay? No, sir. He is in critical condition. They lingered briefly before heading to their car. I waved them off, returned home, and opened a bottle of wine. I ordered a pizza and ate virtually the entire pie before finishing the full bottle in celebration. The neighborhood was abuzz with talk about Bob. Some believed he couldn't catch a break while others said he got what he deserved. I was ecstatic. Two days later, Bob's condition deteriorated and he died. I was looking sharp, with a new suit, a fresh haircut, and shiny shoes. I even stopped to get my car washed and waxed on the way there. The funeral home was not filled, but there were a lot of people lounging around outside. When I arrived, the discussion stopped, and all eyes were on me as I entered. I didn't bother signing the guest book. I walked briskly down the aisle. 
When Kathy noticed me, I couldn't help but smirk inwardly at her shocked expression. My two children sat near her and smiled at me. Kathy took around 15 seconds to rise and attempt to stop me before I reached the open casket, but she failed, a minor success for me. I had been gathering courage from the beginning of my walk down the aisle. By the time I got to the casket, I'd had more than enough. I spat at Bob, who was laying calmly. My spit dribbled down his white shirt. Kathy yelled at me. Tears were flowing down her face, hurling insults. But this time I smirked. Two down and one to go. I spoke to her, stopping her in her tracks. She continued to cry, but fear shone in her eyes. I warned you, I said softly and left the now silent funeral home. The cops questioned me twice more during the next month. Kathy claimed that just because it wasn't my vehicle didn't mean I wasn't participating. They never caught the driver. And within a few months, it was old news. The cop car pulled into my driveway. I expected its coming. When they told me they were taking me to the police station, I wasn't surprised. I locked my door and looked out the window at my neighbors, who were watching me as I was led into the back seat of the cop cruiser. Mr. Moore, this story is all too common. Are you acquainted with David Kent? One of the detectives inquired, passing his photos across the table to me. Certainly, I replied. How did you get to know Mr. Kent? I hired him to keep an eye on my former wife. I stated the facts. He's been keeping an eye on her on and off for the past month. I pushed the photograph back toward the detectives. And why did you hire Mr. Kent? Surveilling your former spouse. Detectives. My ex-wife has been attracting controversy since she began dating her now-deceased husband. Given that my children live with her, I thought it was my job to keep them safe. So I asked David to watch over them, mainly in the evenings, to protect my children. Your ex-wife told us that she feared she was being followed and monitored. She saw Mr. Kent on several times and reported it to us. We nabbed him yesterday. You may imagine our amazement when we learned that you had employed him, the officer commented with a tinge of sarcasm. Mr. Moore, this is bordering on harassment, and if it continues, you may face penalties. I am only concerned about my children's well-being. I could care less about my ex's destiny, but my two children are another matter. If this becomes an issue, I will rely on your agency to safeguard the safety of my children. Mr. Moore, what you're doing isn't unlawful, but it does strain the bounds. Why not try to contact with your ex and come to a resolution? The last time I tried this, I ended up in jail. They released me. However, for the third time, they advised me to exercise caution. They definitely should come up with a more compelling line. I did not pay David to blend in. I wanted him to get Kathy's attention. The next guy I recruited was even more visible, with a harsher appearance right out of a Hell's Angels film. He paid me $30 per hour and barely worked three hours every four nights but he obtained the desired result. You see, I want to push my ex to the brink. I figured if she had a breakdown, I'd get full custody of the children. We used to be a family, the kids and I, but I wanted what had been taken from me. Steve, what the hell do you want? Kathy yelled out in distress over the phone. I replied, I want you to perish, Kathy. It definitely rattled her as she hung up abruptly. I waited on my porch. You're behind schedule. I alerted the two police officers who reached my door. Kathy accused me of threatening her life, but this time I had previously informed my lawyer. He awaited us at the station when we arrived. My client did not threaten his ex-wife. My attorney notified the police. He just voiced his desire to see her deceased. Not that he planned to carry it out. She saw it as a threat to her life and was concerned because she is still being monitored by personnel hired by your client. Look, having someone under observation is not unlawful. And until you have a tape of Mr. Moore announcing his intention to kill Mrs. Kelly, you don't have a case. Mr. Moore, why don't you simply go on? So she left you for someone else. It occurs every day. I'm sorry you had to spend time in jail, but I understand that charges have already been dropped from your record. You are tormenting her, and if she snaps and hurts someone, we'll come after you. He was not smiling. Is there any way to resolve this? I consulted with my lawyer. All my client wants is to get his children back home with him. If Mrs. Kelly relinquishes custody, he will withdraw entirely. We have no jurisdiction over that. It is up to the court to determine. So you asked, and we answered. So if there are any additional developments, my client and I will depart. And that is exactly what we did on the balcony for breakfast following Sunday. I heard the doorbell ring and wondered who was calling so early. 
I opened the door and saw Kathy's parents waiting there. Steve, do you have a chance to talk? They inquired. Of course. Come in. I responded. Welcome them inside. They were dressed in Sunday best, most likely coming from or going to church. Would either of you like coffee? No, thanks. They declined. So what brought you here? I inquired. Steve, Kathy's father addressed the issue directly. I realize what our daughter did was bad, especially since it led to your jail. But she is our only child, and we are concerned about her well-being. Regardless of what she thinks, I'm not out to get revenge on her. She made some terrible decisions and is now dealing with the consequences. All I want is custody of my kids. They are better off with me, especially given her recent track record of poor performance. I wouldn't want anything to happen to them if something happened to her. I explained. They gazed at me, unsure how to answer. We will talk to her, but you already know how she is. Kathy's mother tried to defuse the situation. That's where you're wrong. The woman I married would never have betrayed or abandoned him. I don't recognize her anymore other than as the mother of my children. Honestly, I wish her the worst. I do not forgive. And I certainly won't forget, I declared. They moved quickly and I felt I had made my point. My much-anticipated visitor arrived on Thursday evening after months of waiting. It was shortly after seven o'clock when darkness descended. No car sounds reached my ears, so she must have walked. A ring on the doorbell heralded her presence. Looking through the peephole, I welcomed her inside. She was already angry when she entered. I half expected a phone call, but her personal presence was considerably more significant. Step inside, Kathy. May I offer you a drink? Acid. Is there hemlock on the rocks? As she entered, I made a joke and closed the door. Very amusing. You're just irritating, she said as I held the door open for her. I guess we're almost done here. It's nice of you to stop by, and may you live a short, wretched life, I added, still holding the door open as she stared at me. I'm not leaving until we get this resolved, she announced, taking a seat in the living room. Suit yourself, I replied, closing the door and going into the kitchen for a glass of wine. So... What brought you to my modest home? Remember our little dwelling? I still own 50% of this house, she reminded me, less the amount I'd paid since the divorce, I interjected. Well, I want to sell this place. What would it take for you to reduce the price? She sought an act of God or reimbursement for her loss plus interest, I countered. Deal, make this happen, she snapped. I simply want you out of this neighborhood and away from me. That, my darling Kathy, will not happen. Do you still hate me so much? She asked. More than you can imagine, I responded. The series of events occurred in a sad manner, but I never planned to become involved with Bob. It simply happened. She questioned whether I could be so naive or unskilled. That's nonsense, Kathy. Events do not happen without a reason, unless he compelled you with a weapon. You made a conscious decision. Was he so much more satisfying in bed that you were willing to risk our marriage and family? My frustration was resurfacing. It was not only about physical intimacy. It was more about his dependence on me. He had nobody. And I believe we formed feelings for each other because we found comfort in one another. Were you doing charitable work? I needed you. Our children needed you. Our marriage need you. But you're saying that your new friend needed you more. Now he's dead and far less dependent. I smirked, enjoying every detail of that recall. I only wish I had been behind the wheel of the car that ended his miserable life. Steve, have you become quite bitter? It is genuinely terrible to take pleasure in the misfortunes of others. I'd want to say that I became this way on my own, but you and the departed played an important role, my darling. That is an excuse. You are already aware of this. Sixty percent of marriages fail today. Do you believe that every spurned spouse retains such hatred? I could care less about anyone else's marriage than my own. How long had the husband been oblivious and trusting? Does it truly matter? It matters to me. Two months. Three, five, roughly five months, if that makes any difference. The first incidents occurred spontaneously. I almost confessed to you that night. I was completely devastated. She spoke quite gently. It almost appeared rehearsed. You didn't, and I'm guessing you weren't as distraught as you claim, given how many times it happened. How many times have you slept with him in our bed? I swear I never did that to you, she said fiercely. So it was okay to be with him elsewhere. Did you know that many of our friends saw it but did not have the confidence to inform me? It only proves that you can't trust some people. 
You've demonstrated that you can't be trusted. Where are we going from here? This is our last house together. How about the kids? I am not giving them up, and nothing you say will change that. She said that her mind was racing. Kathy, I will not even try to persuade you. You were given full custody because of what you drove me to. If I hadn't lost control of Bob's automobile that day, I might have been able to obtain shared custody. Bob got what he deserved, and now it is just us. Her eyes expanded. Are you threatening me, Steve? Deprive my children of their mother. Never, I replied, full of hatred and sarcasm. But if something happens to you, such as a heart attack, a lightning strike, or an accident, know that I will make sure the kids remember you. And if you have any last desires, I recommend that you write them down quickly. You never know when something could happen. It was a statement from a movie delivered by a hitman telling his client to get their affairs in order. I was hoping it would have the same effect. I'm leaving, Kathy announced, rising to her feet. We've enjoyed twelve good years. In some ways, I'm regretful. It is over. She went in for a kiss on my cheek, but I pulled her away, nearly causing her to stumble. Don't ever try to touch me again, you fucking girl of easy virtue, I yelled, taking her off guard. I apologize. I just assumed she stammered. What did you think? That everything was okay between us now. You make my skin crawl, I spat, my eyes burning with rage. I sorry, she replied, looking startled and scared. Don't bother, since I am not, I replied. She walked out the front door and started down the driveway. By the way, Bob had the exact same expression on his face seconds before being hit by a car that night. Too awful. I didn't have a camera to show you. I muttered coldly before slamming the door, watching Kathy rush back to her home. Honestly, I was the one who started the fire at Bob's house. It only required two Gatorade bottles filled with gasoline and a burning cigarette. I ensured that everyone had left the premises. My objective was not to report the fire until the house was completely burned. However, that idea failed. The entire process took less than five minutes, including placing the plastic Gatorade bottles in a neighbor's recycling container. I fabricated an excuse to go to the restroom, snuck out the side door, crossed the backyards to Bob's house, and no one noticed my absence. However, I wish I could take blame for Bob's death. I cannot. It was simply a matter of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time or just poor luck. If he had followed his mother's instruction to look both ways as a child, he might still be alive. Despite my explanations, Kathy and her family are still convinced of my involvement. In a strange way, I regret that it wasn't me, but I would never have gone through with it. I've been incarcerated previously and have no desire to return, particularly to a northern prison at this time. Kathy is probably at home barricading the doors, fearful she will be next on my list. Do I plan to target her? Absolutely not. Instead, I'll make subtle hints and insinuations until she goes insane and the court grants me custody of my children. However, I will inform any possible home buyers about the mysterious arsonist in the area. You see, I am satisfied with my current living situation, especially because my children live just up the street. Perhaps when they turn 13, they will choose to live with their loving old father. Well, one may hope that the one positive outcome of this is that I've met someone who I believe will be a part of my future. Ellen works for the State Department of Corrections. Initially, I had to report to her throughout the first year after release to ensure my adjustment, rehabilitation, and well-being. Ellen is resilient and does not put up with bullshit. Beyond the formality. We made a connection and realized we may have feelings for each other. However, due to ethical issues, Ellen was unable to pursue a relationship with me until my probation time had completed. Finally, we went on a proper date. I expressed my trust difficulties, and she stated that many former inmates trick her in some way. Now we're both working to move forward and address our trust concerns while strengthening our relationship. Ellen prompted me to reflect on my actions since my ex-wife left. She made me realize that my behavior was preventing me from living a fulfilled life and developing meaningful relationships. She encouraged me to let go and go forward. Her warning about the dangers of returning to jail resonated with me. Her assurance that she would never wish that fate on anyone, including her worst enemy, struck a deep chord. And you know what? I believe her. When I am with her, she keeps things interesting. As tough as I am, Ellen is someone I would never try to cross. Even more reassuring is the knowledge that she would not violate my trust either.
I'm finally ready to embrace life and open myself up to love. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, write a comment below with your thoughts on what transpired. Take care.